So some basics. We have a systemic circulation and a pulmonary circulation. In other words, we have blood going to and from the lungs and blood going, going to and from the rest of the body. They are a parallel circuit. All the blood goes to the lungs, then all the blood goes to the circulation and or systemic circulation and round and round. Okay, so some characteristics of those circulations. Arteries are the high pressure um, highways from uh, uh, heart out to the body, okay? So they have thick, strong walls. Blood flow tends to be quite brisk and pressures are quite high, okay? So that's your arteries. Big, strong pipes conducting blood quickly. Arterioles are the last branches of the arterial system. So arteries branch and get smaller and they get smaller still. Eventually, they are just smaller, just a tiny bit bigger than a capillary bed. That's an arteriole, okay? Now, arterioles, because they're small, they have a fair bit of smooth muscle that's wrapped around them. So arterioles have very careful and strong control of their size, right? So vasodilation is vessels getting bigger, vasoconstriction is vessels getting smaller. Arterioles can change size quite dramatically and they do so under uh, heavy control by the sympathetic nervous system, as well as um, their own autonomous control, which we'll talk about that as well. So it means that the arterioles, the last branch of the arterial system, become the primary source of what we call uh, total peripheral resistance. All right, which I'm gonna try to, oh, I thought I had a blank slide, hold on. Let's talk about TPR for a minute. Because you're going to keep hearing me use this term, so I figure I should explain it. All right. So you've got heart, right? And then, so you've got your systemic circulation. Okay. So from, uh, from heart back to heart. Okay, so if you think of this as one um, continuous system, <clears throat> there is resistance to flow that occurs between blood leaving the heart and blood returning to the heart, okay? Why? Well, there's lots of reasons. We're gonna talk about a number of them today. You know, vessels have a, have a size, they have a length, blood has viscosity. There's lots of reasons for resistance. Well, down here in the sort of middle of this system is where your arterioles are, right? So your arterioles are here um, just before the capillary beds, right? So here's your capillary beds, arterioles just before. Well, because um, these vessels can become very small or very big, they become the primary source of resistance across this whole circle, right? So from heart back to heart, the single biggest area of resistance is the arterioles, all right? So we call them resistance vessels and they create what's called the total peripheral resistance. How much resistance to blood flow is there in the whole circuit? Okay, so we're gonna talk about TPR a number of other ways, but that's my introduction. So TPR, resistance in the circuit, mostly created by arterioles. This isn't a static system. Arterioles get bigger and smaller all the time for a variety of different reasons. So it means that the resistance to blood flow changes according to what the body's needs are. All right, so that's the arterioles. The capillaries, their uh, claim to fame or their biggest job is they are very tiny, just big enough for a single red blood cell to squeeze through, but there are a whole, whole, whole bunch of them, okay? So many, in fact, that never do we have all of our capillary beds open. And in fact, if we did, we would need to be in the ICU on pressors, okay? So, we have many more capillary beds than we ever use at once. 
This makes perfect sense though, because we never use all of our tissues to the maximum at any given time all at once, right? So where blood is flowing at any point in time is as much about how busy that tissue is as it is about the number of capillaries. So capillaries are tiny vessels that have a huge surface area. They're diffusion vessels. You know, I said in our first session together that diffusion is how most things move around in the body. Well, capillary beds, because they have a huge surface area, they're a great site for the diffusion-based exchange of nutrients and waste products, right? Nutrients um, go into the tissues, waste products come out of the tissues, the source and receiver of both of those are the capillaries. Okay, capillaries come back together to form slightly smaller vessels called venules. Venules empty the capillary beds. Venules join together to make veins, and then veins join and make ever, ever bigger veins until we get to the central veins in the, um, in the chest, the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava. So veins evolved <clears throat> to um, carry blood back to the heart under relatively low pressure. Um, so they are low resistance vessels, as we'll talk more about in a minute. Now the vein system, one uh, that or a, a point of struggle students often have, is the vein venous system isn't static. It changes size, okay? Just like arteries and arterioles can get smaller and bigger, to change their resistance, veins get smaller and bigger to change their capacitance. In other words, to change how much volume they hold. So like when we're nice and relaxed, when we're sleeping at night, our veins are kind of big and full because we don't need a lot of cardiac output. We're not sending a bunch of blood to our skeletal muscles. But when we get up and we start our morning run, um, well, we need more circulating volume. Where does it come from? The veins get smaller and that pushes more blood into the arterial system and into the active circulation. So we call that, I call that venoconstriction. Um, and you'll, I will point that out at a number of key points uh, as we build up our circulatory system and its regulation. Okay, so those are the major players, arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, and veins, and they each have their characteristics as we'll get into. All right, <clears throat> so if we look at the circulation in terms of volume, okay, so in other, it's a, it's a, um, it's a system of tubes, of pipes, right? Pipes have a volume, so we can look at where is the blood in our system at any given time, right? Well, Ultimately, the amount of blood in the heart plus the amount of blood in the lungs and the systemic circulation, that's all of our blood, right? So that's 100% of our uh, plasma volume. So at any given time, we can see about 7% of the blood is in the heart, 9% is in the circulation, 84%, or it's 9% in the lungs, pulmonary, 84% in the systemic circulation. Um, what does that tell us? It tells us uh, that there's much more space in the systemic circulation than there is in any other part. So at any given time, most of our plasma volume is in there. So much more blood in the systemic than in the pulmonary. Now, if we look at arteries versus veins, arteries, the high pressure side of the system has a much smaller volume than the low pressure venous side of the system. So two thirds of the blood at any given time is in the venous system, which means only a third of it is in the pulmonary system. Why does that matter? Because it means even a small change in the volume of the veins makes a big change in how much blood is moving through the arterial side of the system. That's that venoconstriction again. If we make the 64%, 60%, all right, well, we've increased the amount of blood in the arterial system by 4%, by 25% of where it was. So big change, small change in venous volume makes a large change in um, uh, amount of blood in the arterial side. So that's venoconstriction. 
Um, <clears throat> so that allows more capillary bed beds to be full and maximally used um, at any given time. So it is a way for us to uh, essentially, you know, one of the tricks that humans have to be able to do is we have to go from being at rest to being at uh, maximum exercise or at least high exercise. How do we do that? This is one of the ways. We mobilize our blood. We take blood that's kind of sitting there in the veins and we push it into the arterial circulation so we get a stronger cardiac output. Um, humans are not as good at this as some other animals are. Um, the uh, dogs, of all things, um, have a spleen that actually has some contractile ability, right? So it means that the blood in the spleen of a dog is sort of sitting there sluggish, but if the dog decides to go for a long run, right, or chasing a rabbit or whatever, the, the spleen contracts and you actually get like a blood transfusion, you know, and you push more circulating volume into the circulation. We don't have a contractile spleen, but we do have veins that contract and give us a small version of the same effect, right? So 